welcome all of you to Keith Ellis' dissertation defense. Uh, this is a wonderful, powerful, and meaningful uh, event for all of us, and especially for Keith and, and Mary Beth. And, um, you know, we often say that dissertation defenses are rites of passage, right? And that's certainly true. Uh, but I also think of uh, um, the journey that takes you, that brings you to this point, as um, rich with many rites of passages. And I think when you're involved in writing a dissertation, um, every day you commit to your work, every day you show up and you stay connected and you write, and no matter what, you show up with integrity and commitment and persistence and resilience in spite of the internal and external challenges that we often face. Those are really opportunities to face and um, go through many rites of passage. So all of that has really brought you to this moment, which is really great. I would like to introduce the committee members, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the procedure today. So I would like to start with uh, our external member, uh, Dr. Crystal Coulter. Crystal, are you there? I am. Great. So Crystal earned her PhD in social psychology from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2000. And since then, she's been on the faculty of the psychology department at Maryville College, where she's currently serving her second year as chair of the faculty. Her research interests lie in the area of first generation college students and related subgroups such as non-traditional age college women and Latino students. She is passionate about liberal arts education and mentoring college students toward fulfilling lives of citizenship and servant leadership. And our second member is Professor Goodman, Stephen Goodman. Um, he's the research and program director of Asian and Comparative Studies in the psychology, philosophy, excuse me, and religion department here at CIS. He received his PhD in Far Eastern Studies from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada under the renowned Buddhist scholar Herbert Gunter. In the last 30 years, he has lectured and given workshops in Europe, Asia, and the United States on Buddhist practice, working with trauma, he is the co-editor of Tibetan Buddhism, Reason and Revelation, and his forthcoming book is The Buddhist Psychology of Awakening, an in-depth guide to Abhidharma. Thank you both for being here. Um, I am the dissertation chair. My name is Alessandro Strada, and uh, here at CIAS, I am adjunct associate professor in the Department of East-West Psychology. Uh, but I currently live and work in New York City where I am the Director of Integrative Medicine and Bereavement Services at the Institute for Innovation in Palliative Care at Metropolitan Jewish uh, Hospice and Palliative Care. Mm -hmm. So we provide uh, palliative care and hospice services to uh, children and adults. So my work, uh, my clinical interests, my writing, my books, and everything that I really do um, are, is really focused around um, relieving pain, understanding and relieving all sorts of pain, physical pain, mm -hmm. emotional pain, and spiritual pain in, uh, in patients with serious illness, advanced illness, and also um, chronic pain patients. So it's really an honor to be here today. Uh, this is how we're gonna proceed. Um, Keith will present his work, his, his wonderful work, and after that he will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then we, um, the committee will engage in a conversation, in comments and questions and answers for about 15 minutes, and then we'll see. After that, I would like to open it to, uh, to you guys, to uh, the audience, because this is, after all, a public event, and so any questions and comments that you have for Keith will be addressed at that time. And then, because I'm uh, my two uh, fellow uh, co-members, um, committee members are on the phone, I will then leave, and I have two cell phones with me today, which is, I think, a sign. But just, <laughs> so I'll physically leave the room and we will discuss, and that will be also an opportunity for you guys to continue interacting with, uh, with Keith and asking questions. Okay, how does that sound? That sounds wonderful. Okay, 
So, Crystal and Steven, um, does, does it sound good? We're all on the same page? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. Okay. Yes. So, um, Keith, you're wow. on and, you know, take a moment okay. to mind yourself. And, and all of us, I'm inviting all of us here, of course, to be as mindfully present as we can. Uh, we're here to support Keith in this, you know, this very powerful group. So, thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, pain comes in many forms, and um, psychological pain can be just as devastating as physical pain. And I want to take a moment to recognize my friend and classmate who succumbed to the psychological pain, Andrew Retief. So if you would just for a minute have a moment of silence for him. Also, my dad, um, he passed away my first semester of my PhD program. But he's with me here today. Um, his ashes are here, and I've got a picture of him. And he's in my heart and in my soul. So, so my dad is here with me today as well. So. so okay, I, I'll start now. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to just give a brief introduction of where I came from and how I got here. Um, I'll talk about my topics, um, what compels me about the work, um, and just uh, some of the things that I discovered in my, in my interviews and in dissertation. I began my scholastic career kind of late in life. At the age of 45, I began attending college at Ellis Hippie State Technical Community College in Maryville, Tennessee. After two years, I did well enough that I was able to um, transferred to a, a small liberal arts college, also in Maryville, Tennessee. Um, of course, my, my major was in psychology, and I knew if I was going to do anything with a psychology degree, I was going to have to go to graduate school. I also knew that I was not interested in mainstream psychology. So I was looking for a place to, to go, and I was introduced to CIIS. And as soon as I saw CIIS, I knew where I was going. Uh, I graduated with my BA in 2007. I started at CIIS in the fall of the same year. I graduated with my master's degree in the East West Psychology program in 2009, and in fall of that same year, I began the PhD program. I toyed around with several dissertation topics, and finally I came back to chronic pain because that's what brought me here after all. Uh, my dissertation title is The Daily Lived Experience of Individuals Living with Chronic Pain, a Narrative Inquiry. I chose this subject because I was interested in how individuals that have chronic pain can navigate their day-to-day -day lives. In doing so, I'd like to reference the movie Groundhog Day. <laughs> For those of you that do not know or have chronic pain, uh, uh, the movie is a good analogy uh, to chronic pain. In the movie, the character Phil, played by Bill Murray, is stuck in a time loop. And he lives the same day over and over and over. His quest to make sense of his predicament, he goes through all kinds of trials and tribulations uh, before and making one bad decision after another before he's finally able to see that things that he are doing are, are making his situation worse. Once he accepts that he's stuck in this loop and things are not going well, he decides to make some positive changes. <laughs> he does that by learning positive coping strategies and helping others. It was estimated that he spent 40 years in this time by the, the skills that he acquired. For many living with chronic pain, the, the levels that interfere with daily living, <laughs> that's a, uh, excuse me, it's a familiar scenario. Every, every day brings new challenges, but one thing stays the same. The pain is always there, and it's always constant, and dictates what can and cannot be accomplished. That is why I chose to focus my research in this direction. The thing that compels me about this work is in the spring of 2002, I fell while I was at work. I was taken to the ER, and I was out of work for several weeks. I finally went back to work, and I worked for a few more weeks. And finally, my body was not able to put up with the physical demands I was placing it under. 
at the time I was employed as an in-ground swimming pool installer, but my background was a licensed aircraft mechanic, which is also a very demanding, very physically demanding uh, occupation. After my injury, I knew I could no longer continue on the path that I was on, so um, I decided that, that I would start school. So. stay focused in school because of the medications I was taking and the pain that I was in every day. But I was still able to stay focused enough that I was able to get through. Uh, this dissertation is the culmination of 12 and a half years of sacrifice and discovery. Since arriving at CIS, I've explored many, many paths, and I finally found that bringing awareness to chronic pain is where my path lies. I did a narrative inquiry. The reason that I did narrative is because the, the, the literature on this subject is largely quantitative, which overlooks the real life issues that chronic pain patients live with. When I began researching chronic pain, I found several articles about the effects of pain in different healing modalities. Acceptance of the pain was the main focus of these articles. I've recently come to the same con conclusion in my personal pain journey about accepting and finding ways to move on. At the time, I've been living with chronic pain for about nine years. As I read more and more on the subject, I could see the benefits, but I also wondered why these programs were not widely known, and how did they really work. Around the same time, I began t attending chronic pain support groups, <laughs> incorporating complementary healing modalities into my, my pain treatment plan. Also, I was introduced to the mindfulness-based stress reduction a few years earlier. My stress reduction program a few, a few years earlier. And I incorporated some of those treatment modalities into my plan as well. Over time, I built up quite a substantial arsenal to battle chronic pain. However, when my pain flares, as it often does, I can take everything that I've learned and throw it right out the window because there's just not enough cognitive space left to function, to, to incorporate these things. But, but most times the pain eases within a day or two and I'm able to start bringing these practices back in and they, they usually work. But then I thought, if I'm having such difficulty with all the knowledge that I have, how do these other people that, that don't have this knowledge, how do they get by and how do they cope every day? That's why I decided to do a narrative study to find out how others do cope and move on. I want to give a voice to a community that has largely been silenced either by a medical system that does not understand the extent of their plight or because they were silenced by isolation and disbelief. Many times people with chronic pain have no outward sign that they have any kind of distress, which leads others to question the, the, um, the quality and level of their pain. So in order to understand the complexities of chronic pain and the impact it has on people's lives, there are certain questions that necessitate necessitate exploration. Chronic pain significantly impacts physical and psychological functioning on many levels. So to develop a deep understanding of the true nature of chronic pain and its effects, the following questions were addressed. What is the daily lived experience of individuals living with chronic pain? Has this condition changed the individual's self-perception? How do chronic pain sufferers experience their pain at its lowest levels and its highest levels? What are the coping mechanisms and healing modalities that these individuals employ? I had nine uh, chronic pain participants, and for confidentiality, I assigned each of the participants a character name from the Groundhog Day movie. <laughs> <laughs> Ned is a 44 year old male, this is chronic low back pain and sciatica. Phil is also a 44 year old male, this is chronic low back pain. Gus is a 65-year-old man that lives with diabetic neuropathy in both legs, diverticulitis, pulmonary artery disease, emphysema, and sleep apnea. Doris is a 59-year-old woman with chronic back pain. Fred is a 27-year-old man with back pain caused by a spinal cyst. Rita is a 47-year-old woman, has chronic back, shoulder, neck, and knee pain. Nancy is a 67-year-old woman with chronic knee and hip pain 
bulging disc in her low back, has had surgery on both hands for carpal tunnel and trigger finger. Buster is a 47-year-old man who has chronic pain in his shoulders, feet, back, neck, and hips. And finally, Larry is a 65-year-old man who has been living with chronic ankle pain for most of his life, periodic back pain. Um, these people come from all walks of life. The education levels range from GED to PhD. Um, the socioeconomic status of, of, of these individuals range from very, very poor to upper middle class. Um, and they also employ a series of um, different levels of, of uh, religiosity and, and spirituality. Data collection was accomplished through a series of open-ended questions, beginning with descriptions of life before pain, their progression through the pain, and where they presently are with the pain. And each of these questions built upon the, the other question, to build, the, the previous question, to build a, a, as a complete of a story as, as we could build. Uh, the interview questions were, please describe for me your life before chronic pain and the events that led to your condition. What is your life like now that you're living with chronic pain? Has your life changed since you've developed pain? And if so, how? What is your motivation to get out of bed every day? Thank you, Megan, that was yours. And that was one of the questions that, that several people said, wow, that's an awesome question. And several had a uh, difficulty answering that. Has the pain changed who you are as a person and how you think of yourself? And if so, how? Describe the quality of your pain at its lowest levels and what feelings are associated with it. And then describe your pain at its highest levels and what feelings are associated with that. Does the pain affect your activity levels? And if so, how? And then please describe your support systems, medical, family, social, spiritual, or others not mentioned. Has the pain affected the quality of relationships that you have with the important people in your life? And if so, how? Can you describe the different healing modalities you have employed? Which ones have been effective and which ones have been ineffective? And finally, I asked them, is there anything else that you would like to describe concerning your pain experience and the way it affects you? The interviews that I did ranged from 20 minutes to an hour and 45 minutes. And I got so many, so much data that it was just incredible. So, um, in certain methods of inquiry, narrative research included, importance is placed on listening to and respecting what the interviewee has to say. This is why it is important to incorporate open-ended questions so that the participant has room to elaborate on his responses. And then the open-ended open questions also allow for clarification of the replies. Each interview was recorded, transcribed, and then the themes were redacted by myself before moving on to the next interview. For transcription, I used a theme analysis method to analyze the transcripts. Uh, transcripts were analyzed for themes incorporating the categorical, co categorical content perspective, which is where relative content and elements are retracted for further examination. Um, phrases, words, um, and sentences. So a collection of themes emerged from each transcript that revealed the commonalities and differences that these uh, chronic pain uh, patients have concerning their pain experience. The interviews were carefully transcribed word for word, including utterances such as ums, ers, uhs, and ahs, as well as pauses in the participants' responses. The transcription also included personal observations, such as nervous laughter, emotions that were represented by tone or voice, inflections, and actions enacted during the interview process. It's important to note that I did not find the narratives, but instead I participated in the creation. For this study, nine chronic pain volunteers were given the opportunity to discuss the impact of that resistant pain has on their lives. Each co-researcher not only explained how the pain is affected them physically, but psychologically, socially, and financially. Each transcript was thoroughly scrutinized for relevant themes and sub-themes in order to detail the daily lived experiences of individuals that are affected by chronic pain. There were eight main themes, 21 sub-themes, and 10 sub sub themes identified in the transcripts. The major themes that are written are to arise were quality of life issues. Uh, they arise for a large percentage of the population with a visible chronic pain. 
the effects of this condition on those that live with daily pain from individual to individual. Cognitions and emotions about self, others, and the world. Further notable aspects of chronic pain are the beliefs and emotions that one holds in relation to self, others, and the world in respect to their condition. The thoughts and feelings an individual holds have a substantial impact on their overall pain experience. Negative thoughts and emotions are associated with higher levels of distress, while the opposite is true for positive perspectives. Relationships. Persistent pain creates challenges in maintaining relationships for many individuals that live with this condition. Chronic pain is very complex. It takes a lot of time and energy from those that live with this condition. Communication. Communication between chronic pain sufferers, their physicians, caregivers, family, employers, and social groups are often strained and in many cases non-existent. Attempting to explain the personal experience of chronic pain to others can be a difficult task because it often doesn't make sense to the one in pain. It's akin to trying to describe the indescribable. Cognitive styles and strategies, or coping strategies, are employed by individuals living with chronic pain to help navigate through their everyday life. However, not all of the methods employed are beneficial to the pain sufferer. A sense of identity. An individual's sense of identity, their fundamental principles, motivations, and perceptions that define who they are may change drastically when chronic pain becomes serious enough to affect their daily existence. Addiction issues. Chronic pain can make many aspects of life difficult at best, but people with addiction issues, in addition to chronic pain, face greater challenges. One of the common approaches to treating chronic pain is through highly addictive uh, pain medications. Use of these medications can be problematic for individuals that do not have addictive tendencies, but for addicts, it's very precarious. And finally, there are healing modalities. And healing modalities are treatments, programs, or attitudes individuals incorporate into their pain treatment. People living with dealing with chronic pain issues often employ multiple types of these in order to navigate through their daily lives. Chronic pain has a tremendous impact on those affected by this condition. Some have been able to manage very well despite their situation and have found ways to improve, excuse me, have found ways to move past their pain. For others, however, this condition has become totally devastating as they feel consumed by the pain and its effects. All of the individuals in this study have struggled at one point or another with the effects of the persistent pain and the changes mandated by living with this condition. <laughs> Some of the observations that I got from the themes. All of the participants reported that their quality of life was negatively affected or impacted at some point or other by the effects of the pain and or the medications that they use. Four of the nine participants described a negative impact on their financial situation. Uh, one of the participants said his financial situation has been totally devastating since he's developed pain. All nine of the participants discussed the impact and or importance of relationships, either with a significant other, family, friends, their pain, the medical establishment, and professional associations. In fact, only one of the participants that I worked with at the time had been able to maintain the uh, employment. By the statements made by the participants that are that are very or living supportive partner, they have a more positive attitude and they're more at ease in their condition. Eight of the participants reported physical and or perceived and perceived limitations. Four of the nine participants reported isolating from others and life in general. All nine of the participants reported they had negative thoughts and emotions about self, others, and the world in general, as well as their pain experience pain experience, and self-perception. All of the participants employed some type of coping strategy. Some were adapted, such as acceptance or adaptation, while others were maladapted, such as catastrophizing or excessive alcohol use. And all nine of the participants re reported employing complementary healing modalities. Uh, those, those, the ones that they counted family and spiritual as, as part of their healing modalities were identical. In addition, the other, the other category in the healing modality, all nine of the participants said they had something else that helps them. These include exercise, music, 
fantasizing, and pits. In conclusion, as this endeavor draws to a close, I'm awed by the stories, courage, and determination of the people who opened up and shared their experiences with living with, with, living with a life-altering condition. Perhaps it would have been easy for any or all of these individuals to give up hope of achieving any kind of quality of life with the pain levels they live with every day. Their determination is a testament to the human spirit and the resilience of the participants in this research project. The daily lived experience of an individual living with chronic pain was described effectively by each of the co-researchers. They all relate a life that has been completely altered by their pain. For some, pain has disrupted their future plans and forced changes they would never have made on their own. This has been an eye-opening journey of discovery and introspection for me. Interesting and motivating breakthroughs in chronic pain models and treatment techniques are being revealed regularly. It's an exciting time to be involved in the efforts to help understand the consequences of living with chronic pain and those involved. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's give, let's give Keith a, a moment <laughs> to uh, take a couple of sips of water and just... Uh, <laughs> Great. So, um, what we would like to do now is to open it up to the committee, and we would like to start, we usually start with the third member, with any comments and questions. Uh, Crystal? Yes? Yes. Are you so ready for me? This is time for, yes, we're ready for you. All right, all right. Well, and let, uh, let me begin, if I can, by reiterating what Alessandra said about this being a rite of passage, Keith, and I just will try not to get choked up myself saying how um, personally gratifying this has been for me, uh, professionally and personally, to be with you through your Miracle College part of this journey and then through your, your graduate program. Um, you were an inspiration during your time at the college, and, and you continue to be now. So, and if I can take a moment to say to Mary Beth, who's there, I'm just delighted that, um, you know, when, when you entered Keith's life, everything changed in such wonderful ways personally and professionally, and I'm just delighted to that our uh, paths have crossed you. Thank you, Dr. Coulter. So, I'm so um, grateful to be a part of this, and now I'll move on. I just have a couple of questions, and I want to let the other committee members um, get to their questions as well. And mine really focus on the idea of identity. You did a great job talking about um, in your dissertation and then what you shared today about the major challenge to one's identity that uh, the experience, the daily lived experience of chronic pain can bring. And I'm curious what you see as the relative impact of living with chronic pain on personal identity versus professional identity and some of the issues that might come into play there, concepts like self-efficacy, cognitive dissonance and so forth. So if you could just speak a little bit about that. Okay, I, I, I really think that um, that the personal and professional are intertwined when it comes with chronic pain because you really can't separate, um, you can't separate the two. Um, chronic pain for many people is, is so encompassing that it, it just it runs into another. Uh, like I said, there was only one of the, the participants in my study that was able to um, to continue working in the position they had. Um, Ned, for instance, had, had just uh, begun a new job when his uh, back pain started flaring up on him. He tried to hide it for a couple of months and was just not able to. Um, I, I think that as far as the self-efficacy, the cognitive dissonance, if you, it's almost like you're two separate people. Um, and it's hard to, to <clears throat> to bring those into one and to make it where you're, um, to make sense out of, out of what you're looking, living with now and, and how, you're, how you're moving forward with your life and what you can and cannot do. Absolutely, and I don't want, I hesitate because I didn't want to cut off your answer, Keith, <laughs> um, but I, I see that, that point entirely. Well, if you were to follow up or future researchers were following up on your work and thinking about the the cases where there seemed to be a special level of resilience among your um, 
co-researchers. Are there particular hypotheses you have or subgroups you might encourage future researchers to look at to see what are those factors that might contribute to a special kind of resilience in this difficult situation? Actually, there's, there's a couple. Um, one one is, um, is the spiritual practices. Um, it seems that the people that, that, that have a spiritual practice or or find or have a religious practice that they, they, they use, um, it seems they're, they're able to, to make more sense out of their pain and their situation. Um, I noticed that uh, a couple of the, the people that did not have any kind of um, spiritual practice or religiousness at all um, were more involved in their pain and, and the negative aspects of their situation. Um, I think that would be an interesting study. Um, also, I think, also, I think it would be interesting. Um, I interviewed uh, three veterans. One, one of the veterans I did not include in the study uh, because I was in a pain group with them at the time that I did the interview with them. Um, but all, all three of, of those people, um, they, they talked about how if they would have been believed at the time of their injuries and been treated properly, that they may not be in the situation they are now. So I think that would be another another study that would be very good, is to, to track the, the uh, people in the military. and Because that, that's, a, that's a group of people that, that have, um, they're, they're taught to push through and, and, and and not let pain affect them or, or, or anything like that. So, and, and also, I had one participant that was 27, and he had been in pain for, for several years uh, from a spinal cyst. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to find out how, how the younger generation deals with, with an issue that might affect them for the rest of their lives um, that that's not going to change and possibly get worse. I, I know um, when I talked to Fred, He's like, you know, before I had my pain, he said I was out in the world. He said I was in school, I was at work every day, I had my friends, you know, we'd go and hang out, and, and I was at the gym all the time. He said, and now here I am in my room, you know, and I, I live in my room. So um, I think it would be interesting to find out how the younger generation that does it with this condition, because there are millions and millions of people. It's, it's estimated that there are over 100 million people in the United States that live with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. It's a third of our population. So it, it is. Um, and, and that's a conservative estimate because there are lots of people that have reported it. Uh, chronic pain is, uh, is such that a lot of people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about their pain. So, so a lot of people are living silently with, with their pain and have not reported it. So it's, it's, you know, there's just so much to be done in this area. There it is. Well, thank you. And that's just what I was going to say. You've, this is a solid piece of research and you've drawn some excellent conclusions and it also opens up or leaves open, like you say, a lot of directions for future exploration. So, and I, I could go on and on today, but I, instead I'll let the other committee members speak and, um, and I hope you and I can have continued conversations about your great research. So, Thank you so much, Chris. Um, again, I'm just well. glad to be a part of this and I'll turn things over to other committee members now. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Um, but I think we have, with time, we may be able to, when we open it up to the audience here, we may be able to engage a bit more because we're doing really well with time. But thank you. And um, um, Stephen. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Keith. And Crystal, I, we haven't met, but uh, it's a funny way to meet via a phone, no? Know. It is. Feels like a seance. <laughs> like, right? I mean, <laughs> should we dim the lights? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Stephen Hall. I'm
you know, our eyes uh, met in the hallway, as happens often at CIIS. And, uh, and uh, I've been a big, if somewhat silent, champion of the arc of your your work. And being from California, um, uh, I really appreciated what, for me, was the exoticism of your accent. Life's <laughs> <laughs> is much better. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, yeah, with, without going into uh, personal details, there's um, an almost uh, mystical bonding uh, that, and, and I, I don't know about your past, Crystal, but both uh, Alessandra and myself, you have had our own uh, adventures or misadventures with pain, accident, chronic, episodic. So there's a kind of um, uh, club of, uh, of uh, uh, synergistic uh, uh, openness to this topic. And uh, so those are some beginning marks. Um, uh, so here's a few questions. Um, um, how did you um, reveal to, to your interviewees, your subjects, um, how specific were you about your own struggles with chronic pain, both, you know, what what precipitated it, um, your struggles with it, uh, your highs, your lows, what methods you tried, what worked, what didn't. And this is sort of a, almost a basic anthropological, perhaps sociological question. Uh, how, how frank and, and, and something about, um, uh, even if it wasn't the official um, questionnaires, even informally in terms of uh, creating a bond uh, so that they would know something about you uh, in this regard. Well, uh, two of my participants I've been in a, a, a chronic pain, with, pain group with uh, several months before I did the interview, so they were they were quite familiar with, with my pain because in the groups we talk about you know where we came from and what we live with every day, so they were quite familiar. Um, the rest of them, it was, I had to reveal a little bit because just to get them to open up about their pain, um, it's hard It's hard for, for someone, at least it's been my experience, to talk about chronic pain with someone that doesn't have it or know about it because they, they really don't, they don't get it. You know, they don't understand that, that it, it does you know, take up the majority of your life and, and your energy. Um, so, I, I, I discussed a little bit with uh, with probably three of them um, about my background and the pain that I had. Um, I, I did a presentation for a Contra Costa County uh, pain group at the, the hospital in Martinez. Um, one of my participants came from there, so, so uh, she got quite a bit of my story. Um, and I also noticed that the, the people that I had um, more of a connection with. I interviewed um, two people uh, from school here, and they just knew a little bit about my pain, but we had the connection of school, so um, they opened up quite well about their pain. Uh, the ones that, that I didn't have a really good connection with, it was kind of hard to get information out of them until they, they finally realized, and I, and I would have to tell them along the way, you know, I understand what you're going through. I went through such and such, and I would uh, describe an episode or an experience that I had and then that would, that would get, uh, generate more uh, information coming out of them. Um, but it was, I, I didn't open up a whole lot to most people, except the ones in the pain groups that I was with. But I did know, know enough that they knew that I understood what they were talking about and that I was understanding of their plight. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, uh, another thing, uh, you, you, uh, mentioned um, uh, in the dissertation and, and also just in your presentation that sometimes, and I don't know how often, uh, the interviewees were not believed by their health healthcare professionals. Yes. I wonder if you might expand on that a little bit. Um, in what ways, what uh, with respect to specificity, uh, how the, how they were dismissed or not believed. Um, well, Fred, for instance, is, is 27, and he was a, a very 
he was in the gym five days, six days a week. So he's a very physical specimen of a, of a young man. Uh, when he started having his pain, um, the doctors kind of dismissed him as, as a drug seeker, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, and it wasn't until um, his results came back that showed he had a, a, a cyst, <coughs> excuse me, growing on the spine that, that his, uh, he was believed about really having uh, the level of pain that he said he had. Um, he said before that, he would go to the doctors and they would just treat him like he was there trying to find drugs mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and dismiss him. And finally, when they found out that his pain was real, that, it, that he had a, a cause, he said everything changed. Um, and Phil, uh, he was in the Marines. Uh, he injured his back carrying a piece of equipment into a trailer that was, it should have been two people carrying instead of one. Um, and he said it didn't, he, he wasn't incapacitated at once, it just came over time. And he said that as he went um, and tried to, to seek um, help for his pain, he said that none of the, the tests that they ran on him showed anything. He said his pain was real, it was there but there was no diagnostic test that, that verified it. So he was uh, labeled as a, a malingerer and trying to get out of work. And uh, He said that uh, he felt that his, um, his platoon mates thought that he just didn't want to make, go on the hump with them or, or you know, do the physical things that you know, Marines do every single day. Um, so, and, and, and myself as well, when, when I had an injury, I was in the hospital with it, uh, but even my doctor, you know, she sent me to several specialists and they couldn't find anything that, that showed up on any of their, their, their tests. So they thought I was doing the same thing, was trying to, uh, I wasn't a drug seeker and, I, and, and she knew that because every time she would give me something, I would tell her, well, I can't take this because it's messing up my mind and I can't think. So we, we would like go up and down and back and forth. Uh, but, but it was uh, a difficult process to, to try and get people to understand that, that my pain was real. Um, my partner at the time was not supportive and she didn't believe that, that I had the level of pain that I had. Um, it was just, it was a mess, so. Wow, that, that brings up a whole <clears throat> discussion, uh, probably offline for this, but I, and for Crystal and, and, and Alessandra, um, I have to imagine that, that uh, first-person reports of high levels of pain, episodic, or then after a while, chronic, um, without us having tests or, or some organic basis. Um, I'm imagining that there are a whole host of very troubling and painful symptoms or, or distressing, maybe not physical pain, distressing symptoms that are disorienting a person. And when they go into, um, let's say, an allopathic setting, because the dominant paradigm is organic, verifiable uh, testing, uh, when it doesn't show up, um, if one of the major modalities for, for pain alleviation is drugs, and we're very phobic about um, that in our society, there's a disinclination to validate or take seriously that. And it just seems that there's a whole, there's a need for, um, well, you know, ways of, of, of dealing with that. Um, that's just sort of a side comment. Um, almost a segue to that, um, you mentioned in your dissertation, and by the way, thank you for your, for, for your responses to that question. You mentioned, um, that several of your interviewees talked about ending it once and for all, um, being close to um, how convenient it is that they're close to the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, etc. Yet, uh, in that section, you also say they all denied being suicidal. So my question is, isn't such ideation a form of suicidal contemplation? Um, and and um, um, you briefly discuss this, and, and a parenthetical note, um, I don't know what the current law is in the United States, uh, I'm sorry, in California, but I think that MFTs and PsyDocs, at some level, um, there may be a need to report if a client um, 
discusses explicitly harming someone else or harming themselves, and I don't know anything about, about that. So it's just a question about how can statements about any of once and for all, how does that square with them saying that they're not suicidal? Uh, they said they weren't suicidal at the time of the interview. Um, but, but most of them that, that had talked about being suicidal uh, had talked about the, time, the times in their lives when their pain was just really, really rough. Their personal lives were, were out of hand. Um, and I really resonate with that because I couldn't tell you how many days and how many times a day that ending it all across my mind. I live in, in Crockett, and I view the, the Carquinez Bridge every day. And there was a time after I finished my, my coursework in the PhD program, I went through a very, very rough period of, of, of pain and, and, and depression. And, you know, there's just so many ways to end it. Um, I had, I had uh, some of my participants that were talking about stockpiling their medications because they didn't want to be here. They didn't want. They didn't want to live like this anymore. Um, but in, in the end, you know, they, they all have something inside of them that says, you know, there, there's more than this pain. Um, it's, it's really got me at this at this stage. But there's more to this pain. Um, on, on the on the other hand, there was Gus, who said, uh, you know, my pain is never going to get better. Um, it's, uh, the doctors told me that, that um, it's irreversible and it's going to progressively get worse. And he says, all I want to do is you know, give me my death drug, give me my morphine. You know, just, just let me have it until I die. Uh, but he doesn't, he does not interested in, in you know, trying to find any, any kind of um, outside solutions or something that will help him to, to you know, have a quality of life of any kind. I, I talked to him, he, he lives very close to me, so I talk to him quite often, and uh, he's just, uh, you know, he, 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 he was like a boat, uh, a boat captain, so he's used to being out of the water all the time, and now he sits in his house and he looks at the water, he looks at the boats going by, and he can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, he can't get out of his room, he's a prisoner in his room. So, you know, it's understandable that, that these people, you know, look for something else, though. When is my pain going to ease? How am I going to end it? Um, but the ones that, that described ending their pain, uh, they had all found reasons to, to keep on going. And, and they, they're, they're past that point now. And they have uh, they found uh, different kinds of uh, activities that give their life meaning now. Uh, one of them has earned his PhD. He's uh, starting to talk about mindfulness and pain. Um, another one has, has uh, rekindled her relationship with her daughter and her husband that, that was in really, really bad. Uh, the relationship was with both of those people really bad for quite a while. And that contributed to her pain and her depression. So um, she was just saying, well, you know, this isn't all worth it. But once they were able to, to learn how to communicate with each other and, and, and discuss, you know, what was actually happening, that those feelings changed. And, and now, you know, she, she does have severe uh, bouts of, of pain and depression, but she also has someone that's there for her to take care of her and help her out and help her through those. So uh, it's it, it's a really uh, slippery slope and a tricky situation. Uh, thank you for that very full response. Um, uh, I'm reminded of a book, I don't know if people ever look at it anymore, by Viktor Frankl called Logotherapy, where he was in concentration camp and and uh, survived, um, and all, all manner of physical existential um, uh, pain and suffering. And he said that those who did not commit suicide um, seem to have found a reason for living, and he focused um, his post-Holocaust, um, uh, as a Holocaust survivor, his work on, I think he maybe have called it man's search for meaning. Yes. So that yes. the existential 
spiritual, religious, uh, filial bond, um, where the lack of that, that kind of existential pain, very perniciously entwines with physical pain. So um, that's that's a very huge thing, and what I was hearing you say. Um, we still have a little bit of time, Alessandra. Yes. Yes, Stephen. Also, okay. also, Stephen, uh, Napoleon said that it's much easier to find a man willing to die than it is to live a life of pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, well, there's, um, like, like Narconon and AA, do you think, or does there exist, notions of having a pain sponsor? If not, maybe it could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who one could call when one is really hurting, um, do you think, do, do such possibilities exist? Are there any good online phone or digital resources that one can go to when one's in a bad situation? That's, a, that's an excellent question and an excellent idea. I don't know of any specific you know, pain sponsor, um, but there are, there are some pain groups online um, that, that are really, really excellent. Uh, the one that I used to go to when, when I need some help is uh, it's called the Journey Through Chronic Pain, and when I, I started in that group um, about the time I started with this dissertation, uh, when I started it there were around 600 members, and now there's well over a thousand, um, and a lot of the people in that group have fibromyalgia, which is uh, you know, a condition that, that is not verifiable. You know, they, they have, they have pain that, that fires all the time, but you know, that's, there's not, no test to, to prove it. So, um, But that, that's a good place to go, but, but I really like that idea of having a pain sponsor. Um, and I, I think you know, I think it'd be it's so obvious, right? And, and, uh, it'd really be great, and again, if it's on the model of AA, it would be peer. It wouldn't, necessarily, it wouldn't be like experts in pain um, if they're not also a sufferer. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this just one, a very specific question. You cite Kassan's chronic pain for dummies. Yes. And I'm wondering what you feel, just very briefly, are the pluses or minuses of that book for those who are chronic pain sufferers? Um, it gives a good history and background of the pain. Um, and it, it talks about... Um, different ways to relieve pain and, and, and different programs and stuff. However, I've, I've got another book and I brought it with me today. It's by uh, um, Dennis Turk and Fritz Winter. It's called The Pain Survival Guide, How to Reclaim Your Life. Mm -hmm. and, and what this book does is it, um, it, it t teaches you how to, to, to do things like uh, pacing yourself, you know, uh, work and relaxation uh, periods. You, know, you work for a couple hours or, or a few minutes and then you take however long you need to recover. Then you go back and do something else. Um, um, Turk and Winter have been in the pain game for a long, long time, probably 30, 30 plus years. Um, and it talks about changing your life and, and, and adapting, um, adapting to where you are now and what you have. Um, you know, people's pain levels and, and, and their pain situations you know, vary from individual to individual, and not individual to individual even, uh, within themselves even from moment to moment. There, there are times when, when, when someone's dealing with pain and you know, from minute to minute to minute it's, it's changing and their thoughts are changing and, and, and you know, what they're going to do or can or can't do changes. Uh, mm -hmm. But as, as far as uh, resources book-wise, there, there are a lot of people that are doing research now in, in the chronic pain field. Um, the Chronic Pain for Dummies book is, is where I got some of the, the, the history of chronic pain. And, and people have been researching chronic pain, you know, as long as people have been around. Um, you know, it started with, um, I do Plato. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those guys. So it's you know, just way back in history, so. Mm. Um, uh, just one last question. First, a comment and one last question. Um, you had mentioned acupuncture at one point. Um, it might be interesting to find colleagues who have access to um, Chinese language materials. I mean, you know, we're talking over a billion people there, and to see 
um, how chronic pain is dealt with um, in certain settings in China, particularly the, uh, the vexed issue of there not being an obvious organic. Uh, there may, however, be non-allopathic modes like disturbances in qi and stuff. Yes. And we know that for anesthesia limited, um, even though it's, it wasn't understood within an allopathic model how that worked, um, Chinese uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine was applied acupuncture. I have to believe that a possible, I mean, if we had money to fund it, um, to see how one could detect um, via non-allopathic modes, Chinese medicine modes, detect uh, something that could be correlated with the patient's self experience of chronic pain. That's just such an obvious uh, uh, possible source expanding into that area. So that's a comment. The last thing is, you mentioned that alternative modalities in remote or rural settings at affor uh, affordable cost is something that you want to, as part of your future work, maybe explore and change, bringing the benefits of these methods to populations that currently cannot access them. Um, are you planning to go back to Tennessee or any of these areas, or are you going to find some, some rural settings in California, or what, you know, if you were funded, um, what would you like to, to do at, as you're on the brink of becoming, you know, Dr. Ellis? No, I'm not going back to Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for a minute, Crystal. Uh, I, I, w I would like to see um, see some some of these expanded into rural areas all over the country, actually. And, and if that required uh, traveling to different areas of the country and being there for a while, then I would be up to doing that. Um, when I was in Tennessee, um, I lived in a very rural area. And the pain group that I, or the pain clinic that I went to there was nothing more than, than uh, a drug warehouse. Uh, and, uh. and when I went, um, the, 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 I only went for a couple of months. And the physician that I was working with, um, whatever, what, he, what he's given me wasn't working for me. You know, um, my pain was still there. Uh, my, my mind was foggy. But you know the thing was I didn't care that I hurt, so that was that was the only thing. So I still hurt. And he told me, well, the next thing we can do is is, is you know step you up to the oxycontin. Mm -hmm. And right. I told him, well, you know, I said if that's the answer, then then I said I don't really need to be here. Um, and what started me on this path was uh, uh, at Maryville College, the, the uh, psychology chair at the time, um, Dr. Schmid. Had, had worked with a, a lady that, that worked across the street at the hospital in the, the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. Mm -hmm. um, and she, she had sent me over to talk to her. And um, Maryville is a, a kind of a suburb of Knoxville, Tennessee, so you know, it's, it's, it's not really rural. And, and they had a very, very good uh, pain program in, uh, in the hospital there. So I saw that there, and then I saw you know, 20 miles away it was totally different. You know, they have nothing out there, and the people that are there don't have really don't have the resources um, to pay the 175 or, or 250 dollar fee to, to take these courses. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do eventually is um, become certified in, in the mindfulness based stress reduction program and be able to, to to offer it to people. If they can't afford to pay for it, then, then you know, oh well, they need the program. They don't need to to, to worry about you know whether I can afford to pay for this or not. And I think that's the, that's one of our biggest problems in our, our medical community now, is that you know everyone everything is focused on money, and if, if you don't make enough money, you can't get the kind of quality care that you need. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to see you know, acupuncture being offered to these these people. Um, and Alessandra had asked me you know to think about how how you go about doing that, and, and one way would be to get uh, people that are coming out of the acupuncture schools. Um, to come into the, 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 the rural communities and, and be able to, to build their practice up and also build their experience up at the same time. Uh, so it's, 
it, it, it's a dream of mine, and, and I hope I can bring it to fruition. Um, and it doesn't really even have to be in rural areas. I mean, you got people here in San Francisco, you know, that, that, that could use these programs. Um, you know, Steve Rodolman has a, 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 a really good program going uh, for, for therapy. If, if you can afford to pay a dollar to come, then you pay a dollar. If you can't pay the dollar, then I'll pay it for you. You know, you just, if, if you need the help, you come and see me and we'll get you taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the kind of, of, of world we need to build and the country we need to build is one that takes care of our people no matter what they what their resources and, and no matter what they need. Thank you. Uh, apologies to everyone there and my co co committee members for um, having so many questions. Um, I just want to end by saying or conclude again. This doesn't seem like an auspicious term. Um, <laughs> I, I I really learned a lot um, from reading your detailed review of the history and treatments of chronic pain and the, the struggles and and um, whether it's a book or or a handbook or something online as a resource, I strongly encourage you to to um, continue in, in ways that work. And um, as uh, 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 healthcare professionals who, who I've known for many years have said to me a long time ago, it's quite a slogan: pain impedes healing. And um, I think that's true in all manner of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, being sort of a, a Buddhist scholar by day and a really bad practitioner by night, <laughs> um, the first, the first um, difficult truth that said that the one who became the awakened one, the Buddha said, is that generally speaking, all living beings suffer pain. And that was kind of the central motivating um, um, a force in his life for finding ways to cope with and transform that. So I see your your work as um, a very noble continuation of that um, 2,500 year project. So continue on. Mm -hmm. and thank you so much for the honor of being on your committee. Thank, thank you for, for being here, Stephen. It's, that means uh, so much to me. I really, really appreciate you being on my committee and, and, and your wisdom and, and your presence has just been outstanding. Um, I, I know that, that you know, when, when we talked, you asked why I wanted you on my committee, and I said, because you intimidate me. <laughs> and the reason, the reason I said that was because, because of your presence. I mean, you're just, you have such an energy about you, but you also have such compassion about you, and, and you don't intimidate me anymore. So. <laughs> I'm sorry class. to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Crystal, and, and thank you, Stephen, um, for this very thoughtful um, and meaningful questions and comments. Um, I have asked you a lot of questions the past two years, right? So I think I've asked all the questions, even. Um, um, I think we've gone to um, some very meaningful depths uh, in, in, in working together. I just wanted to to say again um, what an honor it's been for me to be part of this uh, journey with you. I, I I have so much to say, but of course I'm going to keep it short. I just want to say to mention two two ways in which I think your work is very special and and why it is an incredible contribution. Um, to the existing literature and, and, and the world. And the first one is, um, you know, I am very involved, you know, I, I work with pain, chronic pain, chronic non-malignant pain, and chronic malignant pain. So I'm also involved in training physicians and um, from a psychological perspective of understanding the implications of pain. And so I think your work really allows a window into the soul of uh, the patient with chronic pain, the experience. That's why it's so important because I think a lot of you, know, some of the comments that we all, all, all of you have made really speak to the fact that healthcare providers are often not trained or they're trained in only one modality and they burn out after, you know, <laughs> the first year they do a fellowship in pain, for example, and they are kind of trained by the system to treat everyone as a potential malingerer, you know, somebody who just wants drugs. 
And in fact, then they get frustrated because drugs is mostly the only thing that they have to offer. And so it's kind of a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a vicious cycle. And so what they need, and they so need, is to get in touch with the human piece, with who the patient mm -hmm. is. Who is the individual experiencing pain? What are the hopes and dreams? And certainly the system is not set up for that because they have maybe, you know, seven minutes. But there is a way in which they can be exquisitely mindful and present in the moment and connecting with some of the truth that you have um, uh, uh, unveiled, you know, and made available to us in terms of the experience of your participants. I think um, getting this message out in the open would really allow to change the paradigm. And we need the paradigm to be changed because, you know, the CDC, we're talking about addiction. I mean, there are more deaths by opioid overdose mm -hmm. than heroin uh, uh, overdose, yes. than drug addiction. And so some of this is, co is created by the, the medical community. You know, the, this is all very complicated. I'm not complex. I'm not trying to minimize it. But the reality is we do need to change the paradigm and the way we look at pain. You know, Cecily Saunders, who was the, um, the founder of hospice, of the movement, movement of hospice, she was a, a social worker and then a nurse and then became a physician in England when she opened the first hospice, coined the construct of total pain. Mm -hmm. And that everyone, you know, whether they have a serious illness or not, everyone experiences different components of pain, you know, the, 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 the physical, the psychological, the emotional. And so we need to look at all that. And your work really allows uh, people to understand. You need to cut through, look at the pain and who are you and how can I help you. So to me that is an amazing contribution. Um, and because your work is so solid, um, you can go anywhere, you can take this anywhere, I really feel, you know, in terms of conferences, um, mainstream, where we can really change this. And this is so much more powerful because here in a way we're preaching to the choir, which is beautiful, but at the same time we do want to change the paradigm where it's needed. And so that's my first comment about how your work is so special. Secondly, to me, uh, your work and you, the way you work with this, you really embody what I understand being the spirit of the school, the spirit and the mission of CIIS. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, we talk a lot about embodied learning and embodied inquiry and, and what is all this embodied stuff? And, and you really embody that mm -hmm. uh, for me, the fact that you have been engaged in inquiry that has taken you so close to what you were experiencing in the moment and then dealing with exacerbations of pain during this journey mm -hmm. and being able to attend to that, continue your work, re-engage in your work, and also be mindful enough of your own counter-transference, right, of your yes. own biases, of your own thoughts to be able and present, able to receive whatever the participants were giving to you and to receive them and, and, and to receive them and hold it in an unbiased manner, at least aware of what was coming up for you. And that is so incredibly powerful and unique. And this is to encourage that kind of inquiry. I think that's one of the reasons why this school exists and why we're all so committed uh, to being part of this journey. And um, so one one question for me, um, you know, and I, and, you know, Stephen, you, you raised some important questions. I just wanted to make a quick comment since we have a little time. You know, the suicidality for, for you know, what are the responsibilities? I mean, also for the audience here, you know, when you do uh, this kind of inquiry and, and people can tell you all kinds of stuff and how do you hold it, right? If they say, I am so distressed that I really want to kill myself. As a clinical psychologist, I'm a mandated reporter, so I'm very mindful of those issues. And so St um, Keith asked the question of suicidality at the time because we need to remember that every suicide assessment is valid at that point in time, unfortunately, and unfortunately can change, but he had a really good sense that there was no immediate risk. If you do feel, anybody feel that there was an immediate risk, you know, he Absolutely. would have alerted me and we would have taken action, of course. Um, and so that, that's, uh, you know, it's important to remember because when you engage in a, in a controlled but not so controlled, you go to people's houses and, you know, you receive whatever they tell you. It gets kind of tricky. It gets tricky, and 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 I have to say, Keith followed the, the highest standards of you know in terms of methodology and highest ethical standards. I've been so incredibly impressed by the rigor of his thinking and his approach to this to, to this work. Um, I my question for you is really, um, 
if you, if you, I know that all these participants, they're part of you, they become part of you, and you know, and so in a way you're transformed in so many ways, and, and they'll always be with you. But is there someone, is there one of the participants that who perhaps has affected you in most profound ways, or something that you, that you feel that you can share with us as part of this uh, journey? Well, several, like you said, all of them have, have, have touched me. Um, I, I think Gus probably more than the rest. Um, he uh, he's pretty crotchety, and he uh, he doesn't get to go out. Uh, he sits in his room most days. Um, his room is probably I don't know, twelve by twelve, maybe, and he's got this whole world in this little room. That's where we did his interview. And of course, he talked and talked and talked. And the interview lasted probably an hour and 45 minutes. And he also smoked. And he put out one cigarette and lighted another, as soon as he did. So we were in a, a very small room. And, and I don't smoke. Um, we were in a small room with, with not very good circulation. Uh, and after the interview, he wanted me to hang out and talk with him a little while. So, I did, and I was sitting there, and, and finally it's like, well, I, I need to go. Um, I stood up to leave, and I reached for the door, and the next thing I knew, I was on the floor. There was not enough oxygen in the room to support two people, <laughs> and he was ready for it. Um, so uh, he called, he, he lives in my neighborhood, so he called Mary Beth, and she came over, and... Um, I was mopping the floor. <laughs> and, 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 Mary Beth is a, a registered nurse, and she uh, used to work in uh, critical care. And when she saw me, she thought I was dead. Mm. Um, she said that she's seen dead people look more alive than I did at that point. Uh, I was just, I was ashen, and I just, it took several weeks to get over the experience. Mm. Um, but, but that stayed with me, and, and what that taught me was that, you know, I, I need to be more aware of, of myself and my situation as well. And, and I mean, I realized that you know th this man, you know, craved craved company. I mean, he was he could go out on the street in San Francisco and have a crowd around him within ten minutes. You know, I mean, he's that that kind of a person. Um, he's, he's such a good storyteller and loves to talk and be around people. Um, but at, at that point, it was you know I needed to to, to, to back up, and I, I wasn't aware of what was happening. Of course, with oxygen deprivation, you know, I wasn't thinking clearly either. So. Um, that, that I think was the most, the one that stuck with me the yeah. most, and, and just his situation really, mm -hmm. um, yes. because he's, he's just so, he was so robust before and now he's just a shell of what he wants to be. You know, like I said, he watches, he sits in his room where he can see the, the water, he sees the boats go back and forth like, all day long, and you know, it's like, wow, man, that's, that's what I could be doing, but here I am sitting here you know, waiting to die. It sounds like you temporarily, luckily, entered his prison. I did enter his prison. And you were kind of, a, you know, in, 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 that, in that situation. Now, I've never really heard of anybody risking their lives for the dissertation. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> this is like a whole different level. In terms of embodied. This, this, involved, this involved a trip to the hospital as well. So this this is, is really bad. Yeah. 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 And when, when, when Keith told me on the phone, I, I was speechless yes. and, and, and shocked, yes. but, um, but this is yet another way in which, you know, you, you've reached so many levels of depth, and just to, you know, to clarify that when you work with this population, it gets really tricky, very vulnerable population, mm -hmm. and the coping skills, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's that easy. was really a coping skill, yeah. the smoke, the chain smoking, mm -hmm. and, and also for, for all of us, you know, when we do participatory inquiry in this kind of research, it's, you know, to, to remember that we're there for them, we're there for the work, but also we need always to remember our own boundaries and to be mindful of that. And, and it's easy to, to, to get wrapped up in, in, it is. in, in the person you're with, it especially is. when you, you live with the same thing or yes. similar things that they do. Yes, so. and when you're compassionate yes. and present and you really want to help. So that's, that's amazingly powerful. Um, <coughs> now, I love your idea of the of bringing resources, because I work in the integrated medicine world, so um, 
to bring resources to, to whoever needs them. And so the, the idea of acupuncture, acupuncture students, I think that's very, uh, I remember our conversation about how can you make it happen practically, think about yes. practical ways. And I think this is very practical and a wonderful um, opportunity because in fact, um, uh, acupuncture is now considered, and I don't, I'm ambivalent about, about that term, but it's considered an evidence-based treatment so it's not, it's complementary, but it's evidence-based. There's a lot of evidence now, randomized control studies, that acupuncture is really effective. So something like that would be definitely a winner. And I, um, and I, and I really encourage you to take this, um, you know, to, to enjoy um, <coughs> the accomplishment, but also to take it to the next level, because uh, the pain world and pain patients, they need this. This is really needed. Um, well, um, I would like, if this sounds like a, like a good time, uh, Crystal and, and Stephen, to perhaps open it up for a few, for, for some time, maybe 10 minutes or so, to um, the audience here. Um, we've all felt, there's a lot of energy in this room. I'm definitely feeling Crystal and, and, and Stephen's energy through this uh, machine, um, but it's coming, you know, loud and clear. And, um, I know everybody here is very present and very supportive. So um, if this sounds like a good time to do that, we can open it up for some questions and comments from you guys. Yes, ma'am. Um, Keith, I remember Craig in a colloquium talking about how our dissertation changes us and how the engagement with with the topic um, transforms us, really. And um, I think that's alluded to in the idea of this being a rite of passage. And I'm just wondering to whatever level you're comfortable with sharing how this this process has, has changed you, what's, what's changed for you, what's shifted or opened or? It's made me more aware of, of other people's situations less judgmental. I mean, you know, even with what I have, you know, I was still judgmental about other people's situations and their pain and this and that. But talking to the people that I've talked to and seeing how they live, what they struggle with, and what they do, and the resilience that they have, um, it's really, really opened my mind. Uh, Buster, for instance, when, when I went to Buster's house, I knocked on the door for probably five minutes before he came to the door. He came to the door in his underwear. You know, he's like, "Oh, I wasn't ready for you." Said, okay, well, you know, when you get ready, you know, no, we'll, we'll do this. Um, but he lived in a living room that he rented from someone, um, and I think a week after our interview, he was he was kicked out. And he went to the homeless shelter because he didn't have the means to to, to support himself. Um, but. If I would have made, and, and I kind of did make a judgment about him at that point, you know, I was like, wow, this guy's really goofy. But it's not that he was really goofy, it's just that he had so much going on in his life. You know, he had two kids that, that he, he loved dearly and talked about them a lot, but hardly ever gets to see them, you know, because of his situation. Um, he was very active in the music business. Uh, he had a very stressful, demanding job. He was a, a carpet installer for 30 years, and it beat him up, you know, it beat up his whole body. And learning about you know his situation, his struggles, and, and, and Gus and his struggles, uh, it, it, it's easy to, to, to stand back and judge people how they are. But if you do that, to me, then you're really not you're not being a complete person and, and being whole. You know, because what what this person is going through is really a reflection of, of me. You know, it's what what I'm what I'm what I'm projecting onto. Me. Not, not taking in what, what is his experience. And I, I think that that's really helped me to open up and, and, and understand people. Um, and understand that, that you know, not everyone can get by the same way or do the same things. So.
All right, I've got a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of times when you were responding, I think, to Stephen, uh, the, the, the drug factory clinic that you were seeing in rural Tennessee and the, the fogginess in the brain. I was wondering if that came up in your other respondents uh, as, you know, the drug side effects and, and that influencing their quality of life. And also if you saw any uh, significant difference with alternative treatments. Complementary treatments. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, and, and more so in, uh, um, in the pain group that I'm involved in online, actually, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, a lot of the people that I interviewed uh, do not take narcotic medications anymore. Um, some still do. And, and there were several that said, Know, I had to have this before I could even come to meet you, and I didn't even know if that was going to help me to get here. So, um, a, a lot of them, you know, rely on those. But I noticed um, that several. One, one of the one of my participants, uh, Nancy, has had chronic pain for well over 20 years, and, um, and she takes you know, Aleve and, and, and Tylenol for her pain. You know, and, and just won't take any, any uh, pain medication. That, that's what I do. I, I, if my pain really flares bad, you know, I'll take a, a mild um, uh, pain reliever. But usually it's uh, diclofenac, which is you know, like a wrapped up ibuprofen and uh, uh, Tylenol. As far as in the pain group I'm in, um, a lot of those people live for their drugs. You know, they really do. My doctor's cutting me off of this, so oh, what am I going to do? And they're not looking for any kind of complementary um, healing modalities or treatments. You know, they're just looking for, they want a magic pill that's going to make them better. You know, there is no magic pill when you, when you have this. And I also found that, that by changing, um, changing the way you think you know, about yourself and about your situation, looking for the positives, that really helps a lot. When I first hurt myself, I didn't know what I was going to be able to do. You know, even when I started school, um, I wasn't able to sit on the desk for you know, 50 minutes at a time. It was just really, really tough. Um, and I was at my doctor's office two, three times a week sometimes. You know, this isn't working. This isn't working. What am I going to do? And when she had no clue, she didn't know what to tell me what to do. Um, when I got into the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, I started learning some techniques and some, some strategies to help live with this, you know, to help, to help not so much control the pain, but control my thoughts and my reactions to it. So I, I think that's that's one of the big things that we need to, to, to get out there is, you know, this is where you're at. Um, and, and you may not have this for the rest of your life, but it's with you now. So let's find a way to deal with it that is not um, not detrimental to your health or, or you know to your psyche. And see what you can do. And what you can do. Thanks. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, I know that <coughs> um, you're sort of like famous for your baking and your muffins. And I know this is like one of the many different mindfulness-based sort of techniques or practices that you can do. Can you maybe name some other practices or techniques that work really well for you know, helping you just you know, cope with some of the things and that really just sort of like sink in and settle into the, the process you're going through? Thinking is a big one for me. Um, and, and it's kind of a distraction. You know, it distracts me from the pain. Um, music. You know, I, I, I put on my headphones and crank it up and, and, and just, you know, the music fills my body and doesn't leave room for the pain. Walking is another one. Being out in nature, you know that that I think even even more so than baking is, is being out in nature. Um, at one point, uh, I took a year of medical leave um, the year after my dad died. Um, Mary, Mary Beth had, had fallen uh, at home and had injured herself, and she was out of work for several months. Um, so not only was I dealing with my pain, I was dealing with her pain as well. You know, and, and we were trying to to maintain. Our, our environment, and, um, and I didn't really know that I was going to make it back to school. 
we ended up taking a trip, a three week trip, and uh, we called it our Ring of Fire tour. And we went to, to all the volcanoes from between here and, and, uh, and Seattle. And we camped at every one of them. And um, just being out in nature and getting the healing energy from the earth was, was more than, than, than anything that I've ever done. So, and when I came back from that trip, I was regenerated. Uh, I felt I felt refreshed. And I was ready to move on. Uh, not long after that, we did our uh, our retreat at, at the Pinnacles, mm -hmm. and uh, and being out there and being around my my family, you know, my, my my school family, you know, um, <laughs> and, and and the the trials and tribulations we went through that weekend. <laughs> that was a great trip, of course. <laughs> um, but being out in nature just really rejuvenated me. And, and then being around the people that I was going to finish up my, my school with. Um, because you guys were new coming in. So I felt like I was kind of new coming back with you guys. And uh, it, was, it was very, very transformative and very healing to me. And when I came back to finish my last year of coursework, I came back with one, one thing in mind. And that was, I'm not going to take any courses that do not have directly to do with my dissertation mm -hmm. topic and, and, and get it by. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alessandro was brought up on like as well. Thank you. I can make a quick comment about the um, um, the alternative complementary issue and, and notice why a lot of people use the term alternative and, and I've, I've kind of <laughs> drilled it into Keith. <laughs> So it almost has like an automatic response, complimentary, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because that's how you know you you change the paradigm. Because yes. these modalities were used to be described as alternative, and that always created you know some pushback from the medical community. And so now, um, the, really, the, the way you know, like when you talk about suicide, people, some activists in the world of suicide tend to say, you know completed suicide instead of committed, or maybe that's not the best term, or death by suicide, instead of say committing, which has that kind of negative, mm -hmm. you know, pathological, criminalized kind of quality mm -hmm. to it. So going back to alternative, uh, the idea is integrative or complementary, because you can use them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's really when it works best. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say that, of course, in this journey, you know, the, the idea is to respect people where they're at, some people will take opioid medication without abusing them and be able to use integrative practices. Some other people will decide not to take any opioid medication. So there is a big continuum. So in terms of just letting people know, is if someone takes opioids, you know, and they they really follow the regimen and um, and they can do that, that's that's okay. There is a role for opioid medicine, you know, and certainly in in, in malignant. Um, uh, pain, but but for example, even in malignant pain, I, I was consulted interestingly on a patient who is a, a woman uh, used to be an anthropologist, quite you know a very very well known anthropologist, and she's 70 years old and she has gastric cancer and she has weeks really in terms of her prognosis and she doesn't want to take anything other than uh, she was, doesn't want to take anything at all, so she takes a little bit of ibuprofen. So the, the, the medical team consulted me because they think, well, she doesn't have capacity to make decision because it's crazy that you want to treat terminal cancer with, with the integrative modalities. Right. And so that my role then becomes to educate them and get, what well, you get a team. You don't just give one modality. So uh, she's getting acupuncture, she's getting Reiki, she's getting hypnosis, she's getting healing touch, she's getting a little bit of thought field therapy. Um, because we know the emotional distress. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about one session of acupuncture, you know, maybe once a month, and let's see if that helps. When you want to do it, you, can, you have to do it intensely, as intensely as you would provide a medical, uh, medical pharmacological modality. Absolutely. Around the clock, yes. integrated medicine uh, practices. So this is, again, what, what you're describing with your work, even more a contribution in this, because you really speak to the, um, to the way of holding both. And respecting people with that. So, sorry, no, I wasn't supposed to speak, but just to clarify. Go ahead. Yes, Something was percolating for me as you were talking specifically around women's health and thinking specifically around chronic 
monthly pain with associated with dysmenorrhea or even endometriosis, which is really, really painful and often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or just ignored. And I'm wondering if that came up at all in any of your research or in any of the female subjects that you, because it seems like if you're dealing with that on a regular monthly basis and then you've got everything else on top of it, I'm just I'm wondering if that came up at all. It didn't come up at all, um, but the female patients or, or participants that I, that I interviewed, um, their, their pain, their physical pain that they live with every day um, really drives most of their thought processes. And two, two of the, 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 the patients that I, that I interviewed were, were, were older, and, and they've been having their pain for a long time. And that's, that's you know, just all they talked about really was their, their you know, physical pain that they have associated with, with their injuries or, or what happened to them. And do you mean, by driving their thought processes, do you mean that they had less of an ability to suppress or to, to, to kind of power through or? It just, or they were just really identified with? They, they, they identify with their pain, and it, and it pretty much consumes most of their day. Um, Nancy, for instance, curls up in her bed with, with her cats and her dogs all day. Mm -hmm. She takes her dogs outside, and she goes back in her house, and, and she's, she, she's a hermit. She says, I love people, I want to be around people, but not like this. I, I don't want to be where, where I'm going to go out somewhere, and I'm going to be hurting so bad that I'm going to ruin everyone else's time, and I just don't. She said, it makes me a nasty, nasty person. I don't want to be around people. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that was a very good question. I, I have to speak. Because I just want to acknowledge, it's not a question, it's more an acknowledgement and a mirroring of who you are and where you come from and what you've done here. When we arrived in the program, um, you, know, you spoke to it a little bit about your family that you found here that you're very much an older brother to many people in this community. And right from the inspiration that you had to start a, you know, a student retreat to now it being a part of the curriculum, you know, those things just have touched me really deeply. Um, and Stephen, you said it really well that you, you, you sort of compared um, Keith to having the aspiration of the Buddha. And I really see that, that a huge part of you to free all sentient beings and to sort of lead your way very quietly but very influentially. You know, you're like the mountain lion that leads without um, followers, but you know, people come slowly and surely. Um, so I just want to bow to you and say thank you for uh, feeding this community in such a deep way and bringing so much light. You said it yourself in the beginning that your subjects were, they showed. Um, resiliency of the human spirit. And that's what you've shown to all of us. Uh, so thank you for giving us such a gift. So, this sounds like perhaps um, a good time to ask one more time, uh, Crystal and, and Stephen, any, any other comments before we take it outside? Anything else that you would like to add? Um, go ahead, no, please, first, please. No, no, please, first. I just um, would say I continue to learn and be honored just to be a part of even this defense. I'm still learning as we're going along, and it's just incredible. Um, and the what you say, what you have found and talked about that speaks to the resilience of the human spirit is really um, inspirational to me. But something else that's coming up to me is the power of people to advocate for one another. And so I appreciated a little bit of a political tur um, turn that the discussion took for a while in terms of figuring out how um, we who don't deal with, uh, with chronic pain, um, daily chronic pain, can be the best kind of allies to those who are, are living through these experiences. So again, I'm just um, really honored to be a part of this with you, Keith. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, uh, uh, perhaps it's not so funny, you know, it says that, you know, a hammer only sees nails, right? Somehow talking about pain in, in all the very major ways, and I want to say thank you to those in the room who who asked or commented on, on Keith's uh, 
thesis process and the dissertation. Um, sometimes an anecdote can be an antidote. And um, I was reminded that um, I was asked to accompany a Tibetan Buddhist master to the house of a woman who had previously been very active in various Tibetan Buddhist communities, but she had, I believe it was advanced MS. And prior to that, she had been a very, very active outdoors person. And she, she couldn't come to events, so we made a house call. I just accompanied uh, the teacher. And she had completely outfitted her house for everything being reachable uh, by her um, being in a wheelchair. And what she said is, you know, so many of the spiritual practices assume a base level of possible attention mm -hmm. or relaxation or mindfulness. But because the deterioration of her myelin sheath had, had, had really progressed so much, she said that she was in a constantly at risk for electrical storms and incredible pain all over her body and it interrupted her ability to remember a mantra or do anything. And so she wanted to know how to deal with that. And for those like herself who suffered chronic pain, how could uh, spiritual teachings that sort of assume a baseline of integrated uh, body and mind be adapted or were there special practices? And then she told us this antidote that, that just an anecdote that just made myself and the teacher look at each other. She said, and she had a little bit of a southern accent. I don't know if there's some correlation there with pain. But, um, <laughs> she, said, she said, you know, this is going to seem strange, but when I'm having really bad electrical storms, you know, those ones that I can't even remember hardly who I am, I just kind of imagine that all that pain is the pain of all living beings around me, and and it's the strangest thing. It kind of it kind of helps me. Mm. So I wanted to share that story. Mm. That's, that's powerful. Well, thank you, thank you all, thank you all. This has been quite wonderful. Um, my final comment before I take it outside with Crystal and, and Stephen is um, I'm reminded of um, um, you know my, my first uh, analysis I did in, in Italy many years ago uh, as part of my training required analysis was with a close student of actually Victor Frankl's. And, uh, yes, it's all coming together now, full circle. <laughs> and uh, it's a and so they had worked together really closely in Vienna and stuff. And so we were talking about what is it that heals, you know, different things. What is it that, that heals, especially if you want to be a therapist or if you want to work with people, right? Which is one of the ways in which you will reach, uh, right, the community of chronic, of chronic uh, uh, pain, um, Keith. And so he looked at me and we were talking about different things and then he said, you know, it's not so much what you do that heals, it's who you are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that who you are, uh, echoing you know everyone else is here and uh, in this other world uh, of where Crystal and uh, <laughs> and Stephen are, who you are, it's so powerfully healing and and accepting and compassionate and uh, um, and, I, and I think it helps people connect to a place of deeper wisdom and hope, yes. which is profoundly healing and. So I really thank you for that. It's been really wonderful. And on that note, um, I'm thing. gonna. Oh yeah, before yeah, absolutely. Uh, Crystal. Yeah. Uh, I wanna I wanna thank you so much for being a part of this uh, with me. I know we, we worked together um, in Maryville College uh, on the. Uh, um, see, now I forgot what I was gonna say. Appalachian. No, not Appalachian stuff. Um, on the uh, non-traditional students. Yeah. And, and the, the, um, um, the first time college students, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I was our first generation, I'm the first generation college student myself. Um, me too. I know. Um, and, and that's, you know, you working with me and the, the
quality education that I received at Maribel College and the, 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 the rigor that, that um, you guys put me through prepared me for, for today. Mm. It really did. And I want to thank you so much for that and so much for still being a part of my life. Mm. Well, thank you. And you know, all the students and teachers we encounter shape our lives, and you certainly have continued to have an impact on my life as you did when you were here as a student. And Stephen, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this as well. Like I said, that your your presence and, and your compassion, you know, have, have really just kind of helped helped form and drive me and, and keep me keep me centered. Just by knowing that, that I've got to do something that impresses Stephen. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Alessandra, with, with, without you, I don't see this being a possibility. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Your, your knowledge in the subject, um, your compassion, your generosity, and the love that you've shown me through this whole process um, has just been incredible. And, and not, not being, not taking less than excellent. You know? mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what I expected, what I wanted, and, mm -hmm. and that's what you gave me. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say to my community and my friends that I wouldn't be here without you guys either. And it's really, really made a big, big impression in my life of, of who I've come in contact here, with here. You know, that this isn't just a school. You know, this, this is a family. It really is. My beautiful I, have a, I have a question. Yes. I'm talking my southern ease for Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to get your next PhD, Ellis? Are you going to start working on that pretty soon? generous with, with her spirit and time and love that it's just I wouldn't be here without you baby. Thank you. So wow. Okay, so you guys keep connecting and I'm gonna uh Stephen and Crystal, I'm gonna go outside and call you back. Okay, so I'm gonna disconnect and call you back in in like uh four minutes. Um okay Okay. Okay. Oh, spoken, to spoken like a New York uh, transplant. I know. I know. I'm, I'm right there. <laughs> okay. I'll call you right back. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.